My name is Susan Page, and I'm here to interview Kathy Wright for the Senior Lawyers Division of the New Mexico State Bar for our Oral History Project. Today is August 4th, I think. 4th, 2021. Yeah. And Kathy, um, we've known each other for many years, is that right? That is right. And you've been a lawyer in New Mexico for many years also. Yes. And uh, where did you grow up? It wasn't in New Mexico, was it? No, it was in Michigan. All right. And was there anything about your childhood or early adolescence that influenced the decision of your life and the decision to practice law and particularly the area of law that you've been involved in? Yes, definitely. And I think, imagine it is the same for most people. Um, but yeah, when um, I was four, my, my father died. Unfortunately, I have no memories of him. Uh, but when I was about 12, uh, I just, I don't know why, but I wanted to reach out to his family. He had several siblings and his parents were still alive. And so I wrote letters, because back then we didn't have computers, and, uh, and got in touch with him and reestablished a, a relationship. And my mother was all in favor of that. Um, she wasn't, I think it was just she was too busy to keep in touch, because she had to go to work. Um, and so anyway, uh, family, you know, family was just very important to me. And, and, and knowing who my family was was very important to me. And during that time, um, well, actually, was it then? Yeah, yeah, after my father died, my mother had to go to work, and she did social work. And she would tell us, you know, some things about what she was doing, uh, maintaining confidentiality, of course, but it interested me. Uh, especially since most of the people she was dealing with were poor, you know, and you know, for a kid at age 12, knowing there's somebody lifestyle different than yours was sort of an eye-opener. You don't always realize that. And then when I was 18, a month out of uh, high school, my stepfather died, and it obviously had a major impact on all of us, but the one that really, really affected of course, was my mother, and every night I would hear her crying. And at my age, that was a very powerful impact. Uh, again, how relationships and families are so important, and when there's a break, how devastating it is. And so about six weeks after he died, I was off to Michigan State. Uh, my mother, my father, and my stepfather, my dad, had all gone to Michigan State. So it was kind of natural, and we were living in East Lansing, which is where Michigan State is, and I declared my major as social work, which again, kind of made sense based on what it, you know, my life had been like so far. And I, I took a major in social work and a minor in psychology. And again, my focus became, or it was children, um, because I think child, uh, development and um, there was another one, no child development was one of them, it was fascinating to me because um, I didn't know anything about it. And so that's what I did, you know, in college. And when I got out of college, um, my first job was the State of Michigan Social Service Division. And I was, I had a caseload of foster children children that had been removed from their parents because of abuse or neglect. And that was very challenging, uh, very hard work, um, but again, very rewarding. Uh, I really, really developed and realized how much I liked kids. And I, I could get along with kids uh, pretty well, you know, so that helped. And um, so I did that for a, few, a couple years, and then I went back to school for my master's in social work. And during that, there, there, you have to do two um, um, semester, no, half a semester long, I can't remember what they called it, but it's practical work. So I did uh, elementary school, kindergarten, and I did the children's cancer ward at a hospital. And again, focused on children. So it was sort of a gradual thing. I'm not, I don't think I thought about it, it just sort of was a gradual thing. And eventually I had 12 years of social work you know, practice behind me, and I decided it was time to do more for children because 
as a child abuse social worker in Battle Creek, Michigan, I learned that the attorneys for the children didn't know anything about their client or children in general. And it really angered me because I testified a lot in court and so I would see it for myself. And I decided I should go to law school. And at the time we had a really good judge and I wanted to be a children's court judge. So off to law school I go and I went to a very progressive law school, Antioch in Washington, DC. And it is associated with uh, the Antioch College in Ohio, which is a very liberal you know, uh, college. And so it was oriented to experience again. There were only two law schools in the country at the time that focused on experience, got you right out into the field working. And it wasn't the Socratic method of teaching that I'd heard so much about. And as a person in my 30s who had 12 years of real experience, I didn't think I'd handle Socratic method very well. And so that's where I went. In the very first semester, I um, represented my first client in a Social Security hearing, and we won. And so that was you know, very rewarding. And most of the other uh, clinics I did were related to child abuse and things like that. Again, children. Um, and so when I get out of uh, law school, I moved to Albuquerque. I already loved Albuquerque, had been here before and had promised myself I would someday live in Albuquerque. So I came here and uh, got a job with the district attorney's office here in Albuquerque. I mean, originally what I wanted to have was a job uh, with the Department of Human Services because I wanted to you know, be the one that helped protect children in their homes, uh, the civil side of the cases. And there wasn't a vacancy. And I learned later, I couldn't have afforded to do that because, boy, the pay was really bad. It was even worse than the prosecutor's office. And then my second choice was to be a public defender because that was the orientation at my law school. We were a legal, um, uh, uh, I can't remember what you, a legal aid uh, um, um, agency also. So most of our clients were poor. And, um, and so, you know, I thought, well, that'd be a good one. Well, couldn't find a job there. And I got offered this one, and I thought, well, okay, I'll try it. And I'm so glad I did, because ultimately I learned that as a prosecutor, you have so much more control over what cases will be prosecuted and how they will be handled. And defense attorneys don't have that kind of control. Even judges don't. And it allowed me to differentiate the case is enough to say, well, this particular individual, even though it's the same crime, really, you know, could benefit from probation and, and um, help, you know. And maybe another one, oh, no, we just want you off the streets, you know. And so it gave me that, that leeway. And then in 1990, uh, Bob Schwartz was the DA, and he asked me if I would set up a child abuse unit. And of course I said, yes. I've been asking them, suggesting that ever since I've been there. I started in 1979 because when I started, nobody was prosecuting child abuse. And the reason was they didn't know how. And with my background in, in um, child abuse as a social worker, I, had, I knew very well what needed to be done. And so I set up the unit. We were the first unit in the state of New Mexico. And the other thing that went along with the unit was the safe house. I had learned about this method, um, and everybody thinks when you say safe house that people stay there. No, this was a place where forensic interviews were done with children. And the purpose was to make sure we didn't have a lot of leading questions and to eliminate all the extra interviews that children usually had to go through. You know, and so even the police, you know, and, and the police weren't too happy initially because they want to interview their own victims. And eventually as they worked with us and, and could see the difference in the type of interview and the type of information that a trained interviewer could get, they're going, okay, you know, because it made their case better. And so that got going um, same time. And we had a setup where you had the child and the interviewer in one room and there was a camera and 
then in the other room, we had, no, we didn't have a one-way um, mirror. We had a TV so we could see uh, the child and, and the interviewer and listen to what was being you know, asked. And the people that we wanted there and were usually there was a representative from the district attorney's office, uh, the police, and social services, because those were the three primary agencies that dealt with, with um, child abuse. And let me, let me ask a couple of quick questions mm -hmm. about that whole process. Mm -hmm. Was um, uh, the interview room where the child was with the interviewer, was it set up like a, uh, an office kind of interview room or did it have a different kind of setup? No, it was, that's a great question, Susan, because it was oriented to children. And it had um, different toys that the child could play with while talking. It had artwork in there that the child could sit at the table and you know, do this while talking because, you know, these are tough things to talk about because most, the majority of the cases that were uh, interviewed at the Safe House were sexual abuse cases. And so, it, you know, it took, um, and, and you, we wouldn't let the parents in. Uh, they wanted to come in, of course, and you could understand that, but it would be explained to them that it's really hard for your child to, you know, be able to tell this and the fewer people in the room, the better. And, and every parent agreed. And, and stayed, you know, in the waiting room. And I, I assume the child understood that they were being photographed. Yes, this, absolutely. This isn't some secret thing because no. they've had enough problems with secrecy already by That's then. That's right. And then you talked about this new division of child abuse. Was it called child abuse or did it have a different name? It, as it uh, originated, yes, it was the child abuse unit. Eventually it evolved into the family crimes division because we took on, for a while, domestic violence and parental interference. Um, I thought it was called crimes against children. But. Family crime. Sorry, crimes against children. Yes. All right. Well, that no, that was after it was the that family was crimes. Later. Oh, yeah, okay. because we okay. did take on domestic violence, which okay. obviously involved adults. Uh -huh. And I finally, I didn't want to do that to begin with, and I finally convinced convinced our office to remove them <laughs> from our cases because. Again, a totally different type of case from child abuse in a totally different way in which you had to interact with the victim in which you, in, and prepare for trial and do trial. Very different approaches. And so finally convinced them and they set up a domestic violence unit. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. And then we morphed into crimes against children. And I think we changed because actually the police came up with that first. Yeah. I, think it, I think it was APD. And so we thought, well, that's, you know, we kind of like that, and that'll make it more clear that we're working together. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was crimes against children. All uh, right. Yeah, yeah. When, when you started, there, there were a fairly small number of lawyers. Yeah, yeah. I think there were th three of us. Yeah, counting me, and I was a supervisor. Uh, yeah, I think there were only three of us uh, when we started. And... By the time Lisa retired, because Lisa um, was the supervisor after me, uh, she, I think she was up to 12 attorneys. And I've heard recently they may be up to 15 now, right. which is amazing. It's not that child abuse has grown that much. It's just that child abuse is being recognized by professionals, teachers, doctors, you know, those sort of people. And they're getting referred, and because of the way that it's, the system is set up here, it involves the DA's office pretty much right from the beginning. And, and, and that has worked very well. And the videotapes of the children were really great because, nine, not nine times out of ten, but at least 50% of the time, and probably higher, once the defense attorney and defendant had seen the videotape, we were talking plea. They were talking plea because usually the child has come across very well and very believable, and that's what the jury was going to see. Okay. Now, when you say talking plea, let's flesh that out for civil attorneys who don't understand oh, that term. Okay. That means they, they were talking, they were going to plead guilty to something with a plea and disposition agreement where there was an agreement to um, plead to a certain number of charges possibly with some kind of agreement to sentencing, something like that. Right. And uh, that's what you mean when you say talking about a plea. Yes. You're not talking about pleading guilt, 
not guilty and going to trial. You're right. talking about the opposite, which gets a bad name in the press. Yeah, it does, unfortunately. But which is kind of part of the, the process. Yeah, I tell you, if we didn't have pleas, the system would have broken down decades ago. Yeah, and it would be challenging for the kids. Oh, yeah, because I had two goals. One was to get justice for the child and safety. So I guess it's three. The other was to keep the child out of the courtroom. And because that, that's traumatic. I mean, can you imagine a six-year-old going into a courtroom full of strangers and having to talk about the sexual things that were done to her? I mean, that just blows the mind. And we could use the safe house interview um, for the evidence and, and introduce it instead of the child being there in person. And there were some people in our office that were skeptical because they said, but isn't that going to reduce the likelihood of a conviction because the child would be so much more powerful, you know, in terms of getting sympathy? I said, that's true. Yeah. But having the videotape saves the child the trauma. And to me, that was the priority. And so that is the way we did it for many years, many years. Now, the defense attorney would be there in the trial and um, his client would be sitting next to him. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, but it worked. It worked. No, so. I mean, I don't think we talked about this ahead of time, but it didn't mean that every case you ever took to trial, you and your division, was a slam dunk oh. guilt, was it? Oh, God. None of them were. None of them were. We, yeah. I mean, if you had a confession, which was super rare, that ended up being pled. Okay. Right. And I was going to say, one of the things that really helped with pleas is at that time, um, there was a child abuse first degree um, with children, I think it was 12 and under, any kind of sexual contact, um, no, any kind of sexual penetration um, was a first degree felony, which carried a mandatory 18 years in prison. And invariably, when we indicted a case, because most of the time, this kind of abuse had been going on sometimes for years. And so we would have very long indictments with multiple counts of first degree. And if they went to trial and got convicted on all those, they're gone for life. You know? And so if they were interested in a plea, we, one of the things we would do is take the mandatory out of it by having them plead to two second degree child abuse counts because uh, each of those were nine years and agree that they run consecutive. So there was our 18 years again. It wasn't mandatory, but it was there. And so if they got probation or when they came out on parole, if they goofed, we still had that 18 years hanging over them, you know, minus whatever they'd already done. And it was a very good tool for getting many, many defendants to plead and save children from having to be in the courtroom. And so it was a great tool. It's a great, you know, it was a great tool. We did have, unfortunately, one district attorney that said, no, <laughs> you can't plead them that way. You know, and it was too bad because it put children in a bad spot. But most of them, yeah, I mean, especially sexual abuse cases, you don't have any witnesses. I mean, they're not doing this out what on... What kind of abuse cases? Sexual. Oh, sexual abuse cases, yeah. 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 That, you, you know, they're not out on central sexually abusing a child. <laughs> it's usually in the privacy of their home. And so, yeah, when you say, you know, were they slammed on? So, never, which is why they hadn't been prosecuted for so long. Because they were too hard. They right. were hard, and people didn't know how to do it. Example, when the child is interviewed, one of the things you would ask that child, which hadn't been asked before, was, well, you were in the defense, you know, Mr. So-and-so's bedroom. What did his bedroom look like? Oh, what color was the bedspread? Oh, did he have something on this? And, and the child would tell, okay? He hasn't got anything to do with the crime. But when the police went in there with a search warrant and con confirmed that what the child said was true, from one thing, it certainly shows the child was in the bedroom. And so that would help increase the credibility of the child. Again, a tactic that people hadn't known how to use. And so it became easier uh, to do that. Uh, but no, never, never a slam dunk, believe me. <laughs> and we didn't did you, win them all, that's for uh, sure. You know. Did you tend to have cases primarily that involved family and sort of step-family things or ones that were, were just 
strangers. Stranger. No, mostly family and um, people that were known to the family. Okay, uh, coaches, teachers, um, ministers, and um, so yeah, um, the stranger thing is pretty rare. Pretty rare. All right. Now let me ask you that uh, beyond this part of your of your job. Um, what were other things that you like? We spoke, spoke a little bit about that you did some teaching about this kind of thing yeah. um, around yeah. the country. I did. I did. I, um, I did a lot of teaching around the country on child abuse and also on parental abduction. Um, and it was good. I mean, it helped me. It helped, I hope, the people I talked to. Because, again, you're hoping the, the audience is learning, you know, about this particular topic. And I enjoyed it. You know, it was it was a nice break <laughs> from dealing with the realities every day, and um, so yeah, uh, I did a, quite a bit of teaching. Yeah. And uh, what about uh, supervising? That was the way you 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 advanced in the district attorney's office. You went from I can't remember the titles, but you there were two three titles of attorneys in terms of how much experience you had. And eventually the top thing was to be, or not the top, the next step would be being a supervisor. And I was supervisor of violent crimes, which is where child abuse was at the time. And I kept pushing to get it out of violent crimes because people were focusing on homicides and rob armed robberies and, you know, uh, those type of crimes, which made sense. <laughs> and it was easy to put that child abuse file off, off in the corner because it's complicated and they just weren't getting prosecuted. And so when Bob did ask me to set up that unit, I was extraordinarily excited to do so and was the first supervisor of that unit. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then did you go on to supervise something beyond violent crimes? Yes. Um, I, when Carrie Brandenburg came into office, I became a chief deputy. Uh, and that's definitely up at the administrative level. And so there would be a number of the divisions in the office, their supervisors reported to me. And I tried to meet with them, I think once a month. I hope it wasn't once a week. I don't remember for sure, but, and, and they could come and, you know, if they had a problem, say, well, what would you do, Kathy? And we'd sit there and talk about it and try to figure out how to handle it. And I enjoyed that very much, very much. Not everybody enjoyed me, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> as long as we got things done. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons I was happy when Carrie, who was on our board, suggested that we interview you because you were my boss at that point. Oh, that's and, yes, that's right. And I said I would be delighted because I think you were a very good boss. You really didn't know much about the things that my division was doing, right? But you were interested in them and uh, and willing to 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 let us try things, and mm -hmm. that was that meant a lot. Mm -hmm. well, so, thank you. Thank yeah, you. so that was good. Let's see. Um, they, they always are asking questions about judicial uh, careers, and uh, you indicated that before the, when we were talking, that you had, in fact, applied once. Yes, I did, because that, that, when I first went to law school, that was my goal, was to be a children's court judge, and an opening came. Uh, in our children's court, so I applied, and at the time, it's, it, we have a very funny bifurcated system. Um, you, you, get the, you get interviewed by a committee, which includes citizens, um, so that a recommendation can be made to the governor as to who to appoint to the seat. And then at the next election cycle, you have to run for that office. But this committee was supposed to be non-political. And the first question I was asked was, well, have you run for an office? I said, no. Well, why not? I said, because I don't like politics. And it wasn't supposed to be a political. Those were not appropriate questions. <laughs> and I did not get the job. And that was okay in the long run. Because again, prosecutors had more control than judges. I mean, I tried... I think I had a reputation for being fair, even among the defense attorneys, to make sure that we were prosecuting cases that really needed to be prosecuted. You know, um, that there wasn't this, uh, maybe, maybe he's guilty, maybe, well, that, there's always that question, that's why you go to trial. But there had to be enough evidence there for us to think we had a case beyond a reasonable doubt.
And if we didn't, we didn't, we didn't indict it. All right, so tell me about your family. We already heard about you, your dad and your stepdad, but how about going on into the future? Into the future would be my son, Daniel. Um, and um, yeah, he, he's a very special guy. Uh, and he and I were very close. I was a single parent and uh, grew up here in New Mexico and um, went in the Army. He, I didn't like that. And in fact, I said, why are you doing this? Well, Mom, you taught me to help others. I said, not in the military, because <laughs> I really didn't like the military. But it turned out to be a very good thing for my son. I, yeah, it, you know, he had it right, okay? And uh, he progressed up the rank. He is now a major. Uh, he's out of the Army, but he just became major recently. He's in the Army National Guard now. And... He also, though, he, ever since he was in high school, he, he was very interested in being in law enforcement. And he wanted to be in the FBI. So he's in the Army. He, he really likes it. But he decides he's going to apply to the FBI. And he does. And he gets accepted, which is not an easy thing to do. And, but he's now got to make a decision. The Army's trying to keep him. So they're offering him some perks you know, to give him more kinds of work that will, you know, get him moving up faster. And the FBI sitting there going, well, our class starts in, you know, a month. We need to know. And Daniel's going, I don't know, I don't know, because, you know, he wanted to do both. So he called me, and uh, I tried very hard not to give advice on such stuff like that. But he asked me, Mom, what would you do? I said, well, Daniel, I would. And I literally stopped. I said, oh, my gosh, I don't know what I would do. I said, I do know this. Your career needs to be something you love. You'll be better at it. You'll be a happier person, etc. And he finally decided the FBI. And he has been an FBI agent for, I think, three or four years now. And he loves it. He loves it. And he's married. And in, they live in Pennsylvania, unfortunately, because both Daniel and his wife were both raised in New Mexico. <laughs> and they have two sons, my grandchildren. Um, and Zachy's 10, and Isaac's going to be 8 in August, August 11th, which is why I'm flying out there on Saturday. That's why we're doing the interview with this, this week. This right now, that's we're right. We're determined to get it done. That's right. All right. Yeah. And then I had asked you if you had some words of wisdom to young lawyers, and you said especially to young prosecutors. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interview your witnesses. I'm sorry. I can't believe the number of cases I have seen. I got picked. I didn't get picked. I got on jury um, voir dire, okay? Jury, you know, selection many times after I left the DA's office. And you could tell by listening to the prosecutor that they didn't know. They knew the basic facts of the case, but they didn't have any detail. Now, maybe I was wrong, but my impression was I had not interviewed witnesses. And I know that when I was running the division, that was one of the things I had to teach the attorneys that came in. I don't care what division they were coming from. They didn't interview every witness. They often said, well, no, we're just going to interview this one and this one. Oh, yeah, we're going to put on those folks, but, eh, you know. No, 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 you interview everybody. Everybody, because you'll be amazed at the one you thought had nothing, has exactly what you need to get a conviction. So yeah, that would be my advice. All right. And um, your your most significant contribution to the law, it's kind of been implied, but yes. let's conclude okay. with that. It's child abuse. The, um, when I set up the child abuse unit here in Bernalillo County, there was not another one in the state of New Mexico. Now there's one in every single judicial district. Um, and safe houses, we were the first. Um, and everyone thinks that's a place you, because unfortunately it conflicts with the domestic violence safe house where people live. This is not where they live. Forensic interviewers interview children there. We were the first in the state. Many times they were having to come from like Clovis to Albuquerque to get an interview. And now my understanding is we have them in every judicial district. And I think that's the major contribution that helps children. Mm -hmm. All right. 
And then uh, what have you done outside of the law, especially since you retired from the DA's office? Because that's been a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> 2013, I think, was when I retired. Um, I got to do what I wanted to do originally as a lawyer, which was represent children in, in children's court. I was a guardian ad litem for about 10 years. Totally loved it. Uh, couldn't have done it earlier in my career because I couldn't have supported a ch my child <laughs> if I'd done it. But I, I totally loved it. It was just terrific. I, just, I mean, I just love kids. And uh, I, I kind of blew the minds of a couple of judges and a couple of social workers because <laughs> the, some of the things they did in their trials, where the rules of evidence do apply, they weren't using them. And I'm going, objection, Your Honor, hearsay. And the judge would sort of look at me, and the other side would look at me, and they go, and the judge would go, oh, yes, it is. Sustain, Miss Wright. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, oh, yeah. Oh. You know, which was sort of fun. You know? yeah. And uh, But I advocated very strongly for my children. Uh, I didn't see every garden at Lightham doing that. Uh, we sat at the um, social services table, uh, but they sort of kept their distance from me. Because many times my recommendation on what that child needed was very different from theirs. And I would argue it and not win all the time, but on the ones I felt strongest about, I, I usually won. And usually it was something about getting more help, more psychological help for the child than the department thought was necessary. Mm -hmm. And I'd lay out why I thought it was necessary and the judge would go, yeah, I agree, and order the department to do that. So that's why I wasn't overly popular <laughs> at the department, but that was okay. My role was to represent children. And then when I retired from that, <laughs> I continue because my other passion besides my job, my family, is travel. And I have been to every continent. Uh, I did a lot of that before I retired, believe me. Uh, Antarctica was my last continent, like I think it is for most people. And I bought a motor home yeah, about eight years ago. Uh, I, I have traveled everywhere. I've been to Mexico, Canada, all over the United States. Uh, go sometimes for up to four months at a time. and. The animals and I just take off. And everybody says, you go by yourself? Well, yeah, I don't have another, I don't have a significant other. Who else am I gonna go with? Well, aren't you scared? No. Do you have a gun? No. <laughs> like, give me a break. I said, you just need to be alert. You need to be aware of what's People around are you. so weird. Yeah. Well, they most... just wanna make us all into victims, even when nothing is happening. Right, so, right. I used to tell people that you, uh, there's only two people who can make you a victim of crime. You and somebody who's actually, you know, victimizing you. Don't do it to yourself. Yes, exactly. if you haven't needed to. Yeah. But uh, so so, uh, where do you recommend that people go? For what? To travel. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. To get their gun, boy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Well, Bhutan. B h u t a n. I went on that trip. Oh, Bhutan. Yeah. It is Shangri La. You know, we, we read about that in ancient history, about there's a Shangri-La out there. It's Bhutan. It right. is the most beautiful country I have ever been to. It's in the... Um, um, it's in the Himalayas? Himalayas, yes. And India and China and Tibet, and I think those are the countries... Nepal, things are all yeah, right Nepal, in there. It, yeah, Nepal, yeah, surrounded. And, of course, the mountains are just unbelievable. Um, and the country is... Most countries in, in Asia, I have found, because I've done a lot of traveling over there, have a lot of problems with pollution. Not Bhutan, okay? And they even had signs up places, you know, about protecting the environment. And this is, this is back in the, I guess in the 90s, but it's certainly before we became really overt about our wanting to make sure we saved our environment. And they have maintained a lot of their, they're a Buddhist country, and most people that live there are Buddhist. The ownership of property is maternal, which I thought was fascinating. And they developed a, a they were developing a constitution uh, while Greta and I were there and had asked for us to assist. And we did, you know, a little bit. We didn't do much, but we did a little bit, but it was fascinating. And uh, yeah, Bhutan, Bhutan. <laughs> All right, well, that's good to know. What else? Is there anything else you'd like to share? 
I don't know. I don't think so. I think I've talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was, it's been a very good interview. You're the third one that I have done. Good. And I was delighted to volunteer to do it. Well, thank you. I and appreciate it. And I, I think, think it, you did very, I mean, you asked me the questions and kept me going. So yeah. that, that was great. And I think it has gone very well. And uh, we will uh, let you know when it's on the website and you can okay. tell everybody about it. Okay. I will. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you to Monica, our videographer. Yes. Thank you very much. And I think we're finished.